Hey there, home lovers and self hosters. Rich here with the changing landscape and virtualization happening right now in real time. Many people and businesses are weighing closed source versus open source as an alternative for VMware. I sat down with the brilliant Tom Lawrence to discuss the case for open source hypervisors, the future of products like XCPNG and Proxmox, and their fit as an alternative for VMware. Tom, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you. Now, this is uh, this is a topic, man. This is not stopping like from the time Broadcom announced the purchase to the purchase getting approved to everything has been kind of just a roller coaster for anyone. And as much as we knew Broadcom was probably going to do some bad things, one, no one expected it to go at this rate. I think there's no one said they're going to do it this fast or especially with the changes, which is really hurtful in the community, the VMUG and the partner communities. Oh, That's yeah. where there's, there's a lot of pain. And, you know, a lot of the people I work with it, they know the product. They got the certs. This is something you've been using for a while. Uh, so kind of surprising to see the sudden shift in all of this. Yeah, I would say that, you know, when it was first announced, I, I even remember doing a video. I was actually, when it was announced that it was going to happen, I was on a cruise with my family and I kept thinking, man, if I was at home right now, I could be talking about this. And then two weeks later, um, finally got out to the point where I was releasing a video. And I remember seeing the state of the world being kind of a 50-50 camp where you had the the end is near people who were like, they're running around with the A-frame signs on their body screaming, this is it, Broadcom is going to kill VMware. And then there was the other 50 camp who was just like, I don't believe that's going to happen because of all of these reasons. And uh, I hate to say it, but the uh, the the guys that were saying the end is near, end is near were, were right. And that's... <laughs> I, I'm not typically a doom and gloom person. I, mm -hmm. I, I'm possibly... Uh... Like not just optimistic, it might be a pathological problem with me. I'm always like this, but I, I kind of I was not real pessimist. I was really pessimistic about the whole VM weird thing. Um, it you know I don't want them to do this, but I kind of it is Broadcom, and there's been and this was actually covered recently by Patrick over at Serve the Home. He he talked about other products that never really made it to large market because of Broadcom's purchase of that company. And it didn't have to make it to large market to be the most profitable. Broadcom is really good at strategically finding something that services the largest companies where they can get a lion's share of the revenue from it and then extracting the value out of that product. This is this is their portfolio. Essentially Broadcom we can call them a tech company, but they're not. They're really a finance company that understands how to do their investments. So they uh, get in that realm of, you know, uh, kind of like a VC, I guess you could say. They're like, hey, we know if we buy this product, it's locked into these markets. We can extract this much value out of it. And this is, you know, what we're going to do. And they, they've got a strategy for it. And it's working. Like I yeah. was in a conversation uh, with, a, with a, a guy a couple of days ago and he was pointing out to me repeatedly, like, look, it doesn't matter what we want to happen. Look at this stock price. And he's like showing me his phone. It's like, and it's up to like, you know, I can't remember what the number was, um, <laughs> but it was just absurd. And so clearly they're doing something right. Um, and I mean, from a end stage capitalism yeah. perspective, I guess maybe I don't want him to say that they're doing something right. Cause I don't think that no, that sort of behavior is, is appropriate. It's, it's not, it's the desired results. They, their goal was to make more money. They're making more money. Mm-hmm. I'm so he's way to sum that up. <laughs> yeah, they're, he, they're doing their job, right? They're yeah. they're what is the term they say? They're they're increasing uh, value to the shareholders or whatever yeah. the yes. whatever that generic term is. So we, our um, joke our joke is up to the right, up and to the right. Just so we say, just as long as the numbers are going up and to the right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so that's a great segue into like talking about what I wanted to talk to you specifically about. Is like now we're in a, a position, and I've talked about this in in some of my videos too that. I, you know, full disclosure, I'm obviously very emotionally attached or have been slowly weaning myself from my affinity for VMware due to the realities. Uh, but they have always been the 800 pound gorilla in the virtualization market. I mean, their nickname was Vertzilla for a reason. Oh, yeah, yeah. And so now with what I think in a mid to long term will be essentially the the death, I hate to say it, but I think that they'll go the way of these a few big companies that are monolithic and they can't move. Or it's, you know, eventually, I think that eventually the there will be far less market share for VMware. And so that leaves this big opening now for a whole bunch of others, a litany of other hypervisors, right? And, um, and I think that that's where I'm really interested to know, especially in the terms of, you know, I, I made a few videos so far, one dedicated to XCPNG, one dedicated to Proxmox, Proxmox, excuse me, and both had completely different uh, 
experiences in the comments, um, <laughs> as we've we, we and I have joked before in the past. Um, so let me just ask you, what do you think the current state of open source hypervisors are in terms of their viability and their trajectory to make more of a grab in the, uh, you know, the, hyper, the, the virtualization market? You know, I've made my bias as well known with my love for XCPNG, but I think they've got a system that is very structured, similar to VMware, and also structured well for scalability. We have a consulting uh, job that I meet with Tuesday for a client, and they're moving 500 servers over. There's okay. a there's a lot of large scale ones, and that's one of the things they looked at going, wow, this scales. And we've got so many different companies who work at this higher end scale. And that's where you see a lot of XCPNG. And I think there's a, a good job of positioning themselves from the Citrix changes in which Citrix left a really bad taste in people's mouth. Um, they they didn't even do anything smart, if you want to call it smart, where they extracted money and value out of things. Citrix just, there was, there was actually a, a talk, I think it was at maybe FOSDEM two years ago, how to destroy a community without oh. creating any value. And it was all about the Citrix and their bungling of a uh, Zen server. But this is the best thing about something being open source. If VMware was open source, this is the path they would have taken. Someone go, wow, look, someone's doing something terrible with VMware at the company. Uh, so we're going to for this whole base OS and move it somewhere else, which is what Zen Server and XCPNG, that's that relationship there to go, wow, Citrix is a terrible steward of this project. Uh, so st actually still you can buy and give money for reasons I wouldn't understand why you would do so, but you can give money to Citrix if you'd like to and get their flavor of Zen Server, which works very similar to XCPNG, but it requires a license. XCPNG is the 100% free open source fork. Matter of fact, one of the genius moves that they did when they came up with XCPNG was allow it to be installed right over the top of Citrix. It just, mm -hmm. you could, you, I mean, you like you didn't install it over the top and then have to reinstall your VMs. No, no, your VMs would stay. <laughs> they would be yeah. there after you reinstalled. So you're like, wait a minute, you just kind of like fixed it for me. Yes, <laughs> it was kind of the answer. That's why the Kickstarter campaign went so well. But that only happened in 2017. So let's talk about Proxmox. Proxmox has been around for years. They are huge in the home lab community. There is just a lot of tinkering you can do. And trust me, I like Proxmox a lot because based on Debian, I'm a huge fan. I started in Red Hat in 95. I switched to Debian maybe around 99 or 2000. So I got, you know, about 24 years of Debian experience. Mm -hmm. So trust me, I liked Proxmox quite a bit. It just didn't have the same feel. It didn't have the same feel and scalability. But I mean, they've put a lot of work into it. I by no means think it's not a good product. It also, when I was comparing it, especially the, doing the deep dives all the way back in 2017, because I was part of the whole Kickstarter campaign, uh, interested in XCPNG, Proxmox was not where it is today. So they, they both these products have matured greatly, and now they're both reaping benefits because they're both good solutions. I, you know, I won't begrudge someone who says, "Oh no, I'm I'm down for Proxmox. That's what I'm using." Well, go use it if it works for you and works for your use case. And you know, mentioning the MSP community, a lot of MSP community is not moving 500 servers. They're usually going, hey, I got like four VMs at this client. And right. that's, so my scalability and talking about large uh, stuff kind of goes out the door. If you're only really managing four VMs, you're not worried about how you shuffle them around between a couple of hypervisors. <laughs> yeah, that's a good point. And, you know, from my experiences so far in using both of them, I think that, and I, I said it, that coming from VMware ESXi or even vCenter for that matter, it will do what you want it to do. It do what you need to do. I think that the devil in the details really comes into the supportability and how you migrate your staff and the people who are very familiar in one type of uh, environment over into another. And I think where that's where, um, and I, I don't want, I, I still haven't decided which which path I'm going to go <laughs> with my home lab downstairs. It's still running on uh, ESXi and vCenter because it's a, you know, a VMUG advantage. But I think that for, People who have been spending their time in VMware, specifically, XCPNG actually has a lower learning curve for it. Yeah. And um, and I think that that's, that's one, you know, in terms of which one is potentially more of, of a viable alternative, they'll both do it. But the question is really going to be a decision about your staff, your your people's capabilities and, and uh, comfort levels, and how much time you want to spend up getting used to something dramatically different. Um the one thing I did want to bring up with you that that definitely does make things stand a little bit more into the XCP and G uh, camp for support is that 
they have a one, if you pay for their enterprise support, you have a one hour turnaround yeah. all day long, 24 seven, right? Yes. The, in, this is really huge. People want a vendor that can do some handholding, that is responsive. And XCPNG, from a community engagement standpoint, is amazing. You can spend any time in their forums and say, okay, I don't just have a couple people responding. I have like half the dev team in here daily uh, engaging with people. And not just that, if you actually call them for support and want to have some help with something, it's amazing how fast they are. I mean, not to mention the number of people they support for free in their forums. When I'm talking people who are clearly businesses using it, we'll, we'll just say, this is not a homies you're asking a question. You're like, I'm stuck when I'm deploying these 200 VMs, like, and they're walking them through it. And these people have, uh, I've even seen them find edge cases where they said, Hey, give me your uh, installation ID and we can do a support ticket for you. And they reply, well, I'm using a free one. Oh, well, I'll still help you. Uh, here's no, the things that's... I need out of your logs uh, so we can solve this. And sometimes it leads to better development. That community engagement goes really far combined with the support because I've seen a lot of, you know, one off requests. One of them came out of my live stream with a, we actually brainstormed in the live stream with like, I don't know, 100 people. And we were pitching ideas back and forth. And Oliver Lambert, CEO of XCPNG, was just, chatting in the live show. I did not have him on my stream. He's in the chat. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's how the um, some modifications came to the backup. It was a community-driven idea. And from live stream, it was within 60 days, the entire feature was flushed out, which was the ability to do uh, restore checks that are automated, similar to the way Datto, I don't know how they do that, that's where you fine. can yeah, back up the appliance, but then validate that the appliance boots. So it does a backup, then a restore and does a validation of it and sends you a report going, we didn't just back this VM up because nobody wants a backup that works. Everyone wants a restore that works. So it right. does that, restores the VM, boots it up on even any host you pick. So you can even test it at your DR site and then gives you a report. Yes, this host will absolutely boot. Cool. I uh, have now validated my DR test and I can sleep easier. <laughs> That's, 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 I mean, that's the promise of open source in a way, right? Yeah. That you, you have not just the visibility of the code and what's in it and, uh, um, all of the good oversight that comes from that, but also that it's a feedback loop that's supposed to provide that sort of value. Um, as long as it's helping pay for the developers who are actively also working yeah. on the project, that's the, that's the side part of it. Um, speaking of backup though, and it's speaking about specifically XCPNG, one of my big problems that I see with it is that there's a, a feeling, and this is from a, again, VMware perspective coming from, you know, enterprise, you know, VMware companies or people who are using VMware are really emotionally tied to the backup systems that they use to service them because they're part of their DR, they're part yep. of their, um, they're, they're part of their KPIs and their, their, um, you know, turnaround time in case there's, uh, any sort of failure. And so, you know, I, there was a, there was a post that someone sent to me a while back about in, inside of the Veeam forums, there was a question asked, when are they going to now support XCPNG or Proxmox in the open source world? And I pretty sure that there was a comment from Oliver in there that's, that said something to the effect of we already back up. We don't really see a reason or a need to, to be compatible. And I'm, I'm the tough part is this was the first time he had created an account on there. So I just want to be sure that I'm, I'm, I'm as is not corroborated or substantiated, right? One guy with one post and zero karma kind of puts that, you know, make, take it for a grain of salt. But I want your opinion kind of fundamentally on like, like, do you think there's an opportunity for XCPNG to support third-party backup solutions because they're absolutely critical to enterprise business? I, I think... I like their approach at XCPNG, but let's first back up a little bit of background here. Um, the IT company that I, I'm part owner of and Jason Slagle is president of, CNWR, we're not just a place that uses Veeam. We're a Veeam certified cloud provider with our data center set up with Veeam. So we know a lot of Veeam. We sell a lot of Veeam, several thousand seats that we happen to have. We like this tool. Um, right. So immediately I, I had the same conversation with Jason. Jason's like, they got, I, I can't use it. They don't support Veeam. <laughs> this was like the immediate like response he had. Um, but I said, honestly, when you kind of look at it, it is a big change because Veeam has developed a deep relationship with VMware. If you say VMware and if you ask what they're backing up, they're using Veeam. The, the, the two yeah. are, you know, peanut butter and jelly together. Right. Uh, that being said, 
it did take some convincing for me to talk to Jason and say, well, you just got to look at things differently. It's a total cost of ownership. How much should we spend in Veeam licenses for all these? And there's kind of a pause. And he goes, but it's integrated right into our ConnectWise portal and it generates a ticket and it gen- it's all, like you said, this deep integration. And we have, I said, yeah, but we can do all of this. Matter of fact, I even uh, showed him how we can use a webhook to uh, tie with the backups to create tickets if we need to, along with the other integrations. And it's like, but now it's the tooling learn. I, I think once you kind of get that concept, you're like, wait a minute. So that cost of the XCPNG, I'm not comparing to VMware. I'm comparing to VMware plus Veeam for total cost of ownership. Mm-hmm. And the deep integrations, when you do a Delta backup and the fact that these backups are completely agentless. So now I have no agents. I don't care what OS I'm loading. I'm doing agentless backup. I can Delta only the differentials from a block level without having to be inside the host, the guest OS. And that native integration, I think, goes a really long way to go, huh, this is actually fast. Matter of fact, the fact that they can do, if you do Delta backups, you can do Delta restores now. This is a new feature they added where it can take the differential blocks instead of restoring the whole VM. It can differentially figure out, you're like, I don't know what broke at this last Windows update, but we can go backwards and reverse it because they can put the blocks back in. You can't really, I mean, there's ways to do it with some of the other backups, but it's always done with it. The guest Veeam having deeper integrations from XCPG could do some of these things, but now being able to do that and not requiring any proprietary storage, suddenly these solutions become a whole lot cheaper to bid. And it goes into, like I said, that total cost of ownership. Um, I don't see that there's any incentive. Maybe Veeam has an incentive because they don't want to lose revenue, of course, and for sure integration. But once you build out the, backup systems that can be completely managed and managed remotely from a central place that that is completely a feature i've got a whole write-up in the forums on how to do it i have another video on it yet but i did validate this with the team in public view so to speak uh, that yeah you can run all these remote backups from a central location managing your clients uh having backups and having a whole dr plan that also by the way is really easy for you to test and there's no extra licensing costs. This is all just included in what I'm paying for my license for XCPNG. I, I, once you look at it from that perspective, I think you go, like, maybe I can do without Veeam. <laughs> but yeah. it's not easy because it's what you're used to. Yeah, I think that the one thing, though, that XCPNG is going to be missing in that point and where a lot of big businesses are still leveraging Veeam is going to be for the immutability part of their um you know, their cybersecurity insurance, things like that, where I'm not sure if there's a solution that is built into XCPNG that allows you to create in the announcement in January. There we go. Okay. So it's, it's on because, the roadmap. Which is- and, and they mentioned it's because of their corporate compliance. So they have an entire corporate compliance uh, part that they're putting together. There's two pieces to it, immutability. And the other one is going, is, um, compliance where they have to keep it for so, uh, so long, but they have a whole section uh, in January. They announced on that too kind of solve the uh, compliance gaps and things like that. Cause you're right. This is, that is, that is one of those questions is completely valid to come up with. And that's, that's interesting <laughs> to hear that. They're, I mean, I'm glad to hear that because that tells me that they're thinking, right? Because yeah. that's, those are the things that don't necessarily stand out. You know, when, when I see a lot of the comments that I get on videos and that you also get in videos, they always come from may, I shouldn't say always, many of them come from a very myopic viewpoint where people are looking at from the, I've got this in the home lab, I don't care about this stuff. And you don't know the command line, what's wrong with you, right? Yeah. Um, and so there's this much greater world out there in terms of what needs to be supported to make it well adopted in business. And that's, and I'm glad to hear that. That's I, awesome. And I think it shows where their head's at and who they're talking to a lot. And that's what that's where you're going to get a big difference is you can clearly say someone's taking a lot of time to put an announcement on their blog about these features coming up with compliance. You're like, that's not talked about with small open source projects because right. th- they're not engaging with community. It's the same thing if you, you know, I'll, I'll you know, like I talk a lot about PF sense, but if you look at some of the features they've done in there, you're like, wait a minute. Oh, that, why did they bother doing this? Oh, that's because this policy. Oh, I get it. You see those little things you're piecing together. And then you see them do a blog post. So you can look this up about the U S Navy and how much PF sense they use. And mm. the only way they could do it was meeting a series of unusual FIPS compliance, which FIPS doesn't always mean the latest in security. It means very right. specific ciphers have to be used. And it was right. a big complaint when uh, PF sense changed those ciphers, but that was one of those behind the scenes. Why are they changing ciphers? I'm like, I work I work in with government stuff. I know why that cipher's in use now. Yes, I know I want Bcrypt. We got to use the other one because this one's FIPS. Bcrypt is not. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> so um, from a use, use case scenario and a usability kind of standpoint, 
uh, you know, I, I made my videos and I, I have, I'm on record of being relatively, uh, negative about the UIs and UXs that exist for open source, yeah. uh, hypervisors. I can't help it. You know, I, I, it, I'd be remiss if I didn't say that it was only up to like, say version 6.5 or seven of ESXi that they got their, their shit together too, honestly, that yeah. no one seemed to really care about it, but then there was a massive leap in just the user experience and, and how you they provide information and management to the user. And I apparently am just unlucky enough to make a video about XCPNGs, what I think an XO is terrible ex user experience, and then find out that their their big strides are coming in their their decisions to kind of revamp the yeah. user experience and give a local host management uh, graphical user interface too, which is crazy. I think it's cool because there's so many open source projects. There's different ways projects start. A lot of the closed source ones sometimes are built these weird top down. Someone had money and they funded an idea to try to scratch a niche. Mm -hmm. um, when the whole Zen Orchestra, which long predates uh, XCPNG, Zen's Orchestra was a management tool for Citrix Zen server. It right. was because there was so much usage and uh, they built it because I believe it's Oliver and some of the team had a background in large scale hosting prior to, you know, Amazon and Azure, your big hyperscalers, there was a lot of small ISPs that provided hosting. And Citrix was the pretty much universal back end that did this. And Zen Orchestra was how you manage thousands of hosting clients and thousands of little machines at scale. But because it was not built by a designer, it was built by someone scratching their itch of, I need to solve an easy way to manage it. <laughs> it has the look it has. Yeah. That's why the look going forward, uh, they hired a dedicated person whose only job is UX design. And she has been working there, I think about a year right now. Um, okay. building everything that's out. They're doing it in a methodical, careful way, which I appreciate, but also am, as all other people, impatient and I want to see it now. <laughs> right. Yeah, I want these changes now. Yeah, I, I completely agree yeah. with that. So I, I agree. Uh, I, and I just take the flack for, I, I, I find the interface fine uh, once you're going to get the hang of it. Sure. From a functional standpoint, like, oh yeah, cool. I can tag everything. I can manipulate this and I can just manipulate the uh, URLs at the top and do things and the back button works. These are all things I thought was cool about it, but yeah. there's a lot of wasted space. There is no doubt about that. Um, I We live in a time where UX has gotten substantially better over the years, mm -hmm. but in some spots, we're still kind of dragging along some of this old stuff. So yeah, I'll, I'll take the good with the bad with it. Um, I think whether, where they're going with it, I think is really good, but they're not there today. <laughs> yeah. It was just kind of a surprise because I was complaining to a friend about, about Zen Orchestra and he said, do you know, they have a fat client still, right? And I'm like, what is this 1997? <laughs> like I, you know, it's for 2010, whatever. And, and, uh, you know, I downloaded it. I'm like, this is a, why can't we just make this yeah. the, the UI on, on, in, on the web. And that was, uh, so it's, I, I, it's very promising that again, kind of speaks to, well, I think that the trajectory of it, um, and, you know, flipping it over to, to, to show Proxmox a little, little coverage in comparison. Um, I think that they, their user experience is the opposite of XO in terms of like, they just threw the kitchen sink in there. It's, it's super busy. And so, I mean, both sides could really use a revamp. And I wonder if that's something that's even on the, the long-term roadmap for, for Proxmox. And hopefully it is. You know, I, I don't, maybe I should spend some time in the Proxmox forums. I don't know what level of participation, like they don't seem to participate in any of the social media um, that I'm aware of. I don't think they have like a rolling, they, they do the monthly live streams with XCPNG. Uh, so it's easy mm -hmm. to find information about it. So uh, it's a little bit, it, it could be me just not knowing where to look. Uh, feel free to leave in the comments down below where we should yeah. be looking our heads. Like where is the watering hole of Proxmox information? Uh, you know, not just end users, but like from the team, is, do they have a, good post for that but um yeah it's one of those things like it feels also like it was built by people that hey let's put more context menus here let's just keep making them bigger and just uh, yeah. get as much in there as we can so we can put as much availability in the ui which that's it does look like many of the other open source projects it's there's two different ways open source projects look they look like kind of the way xcpng is where there's a lot of empty space or the we put every context menu in pics we, we were counting pixels to get all the words in there and we see how many we could fit <laughs> there is, yeah you, some of made, our security tools all look like that <laughs> yeah and i made the joke about that uh in or a comment about that in the video like 
do we really need to be able to edit the host file of the the server in the UI? I mean, it that this shows the the level of granularity and depth that they went in for every single thing, which is, I, I mean, that that makes it nice. Um, on the on the flip side, there's no console for people who are not Linux devs, right. which is a which is the thing that that I think that's probably. If I look back at the the amount of criticism that I received over that last video, I think the biggest one is there. There is a large camp of people who believe that if you don't know how to work in a Linux command line, then you shouldn't be working in hypervisors. And I feel like that's such a such a again myopic viewpoint of the way the world works, right? Yeah. In me and you both work, and many others are undoubtedly maybe not in the comments, but a lot mm -hmm. of us are probably watching this video. We work in enterprise tech, and when right. you work there, you just realize you're like, oh wow, there's people who I, I find it weird even with my hacker friends when I found out they had never physically touched a switch, hardware, they didn't ever build a computer, and I'm mm -hmm. like, the dude's a reverse engineer for very large companies making 200k a year, and he's he, I helped him build his um, first rack. I, I spent the whole day at his house helping. He was so excited. He never touched any of the hardware before. I'm like, you are quite far in life along your career path, but it all the things <laughs> you really start thinking about go, well, I guess he never had to. And the same thing goes with, um, there's some really smart people that we employ that just don't really use the command line. They just never, they started in Windows, they're really talented at what they do. They understand Active Directory at a level. I will never understand it. Uh, but mm -hmm. it, Hannibal Linux command line, they're not that good, but hand them VMware and they're no problem. They're used to that sure. interface. They, they know enough about where to get it connected, how to get it out of any stuck mode that it's in to solve the emergency. So they're absolutely competent techs, but they just don't spend any time with Linux. Um, I, I feel like everyone should, but I also have lived long enough in the real world of tech and enterprise going, ah, yeah, I because I don't know, they, they think everyone should know Active Directory like they do, especially the Azure stuff they do. I, I don't right. understand I, I can tell you a lot on the surface about Azure, but I cannot tell you about how to do all those conditional access policies the way they do. They know them really well. I do not. So they have the same yeah. view of me, maybe. Because <laughs> he spent his time on that Linux thing there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Azure is a funny one because, you know, every week Microsoft's going to change which uh, portal you use. So, you know, you, there's yeah. there's actual websites I've found where people are are basically live updating the changes to change the portal. portal. Yeah, so. It is it is a complicated beast into itself and yeah. takes a level of uh, expertise. I was listening to a podcast with the guys who run Bloodhound, which is an auditing tool mm -hmm. for Active Directory, and it just blows your mind because uh, they did a breakdown of the, one of the Microsoft hacks. But yeah, there's, there's a massive amount of knowledge there, but that person may not because they don't need to have any Linux command line knowledge. And right. uh, the... The home lab leans heavy on Linux, of course, because, hey, I can grab a, any of these distros for free. So it kind of creates a little bit of some tunnel vision, if you will, until they get into the real world. And well, in your videos and my videos, I, I like to definitely encourage home lab. I'm huge on that. That's how oh, yeah. I got started. Um, but I also like to share with them, hey, when you get the real world jobs... <laughs> You know, if you work at the sysadmin level, shoulders over supporting end users, not working for the someone who's just doing the inner workings at a data center, but working with, you know, we have to support a bunch of business applications for people that are running Windows. You're going to have to have a lot of Windows admins that have never touched a command line. They're your shoulder shoulder with them. They're just as competent. They just have a different discipline than you. Uh, so having any little menu driven system so they can just poke their way through. I, I think that's a really good point. I don't think you have to know the command line to be a tech. <laughs> yeah. I wanted to add one anecdote. When I was a, a younger, uh, much younger than I am now, I was working for a company that had ASIC engineers who were designing very bespoke integrated circuits for a specific mathematical task. And, and I looked at these people as, you know, this is 15 years ago. I looked at these people as like, they, they were somehow, they were like, the impersonation of true computer wizards, right? The word I learned much later that you know it's more like drawing lines and and, and but um, <laughs> but my big realization with those engineers was that none of them, none of them were uh, computer people. Like yeah. they were they were in, I mean, again cutting edge ASICs that they were building, and they knew ins and outs of different processes and lithographies, and you know, and it seemed like such a foreign concept. And I thought, well, you guys must know everything about computers you're literally making computer chips no that's not the case and that was a that was my big eye opener and you know and that was you know that feeds into like the like i as you get older you and you get exposed to things you definitely get this 
this better understanding of the world and the way things actually work. And you're less about like, I believe it should be like this and, and see more of a, the bigger picture. Yeah. Right. And that was a bigger picture, uh, eye-opening moment. It's like, yeah, I guess, you know, they don't need to know how windows works or, <laughs> you know, they just need to be able to get their, uh, their software up and that's it. So I totally get that. Um, I did want to ask you though, I, I go with me on this. Cause this might be a, it might be a failure, but I'm going to try it. And that is, after going through the VMware example from Broadcom, um, do you think that there is a possibility, a world, if you can imagine, where, you know, Vates is a private company, Proxmox Server Solutions is a private company. Yes, they have open sourced their their software and it's publicly available. And and if something happened to those entities, in theory, someone could continue on the project, right? But do you envision a possibility of a world where even open source hypervisors like those two would be potentially unsafe or we'd end up in a Broadcom by VMware by Broadcom situation. It, kind of like you said earlier, it's the forking of it that helps. Forking is a safety net, but but this is one of the problems with it is you can't just say fork it. This is where everyone runs around saying it a lot, but the reality of it is very different because mm -hmm. someone has to maintain all that. So I, I seen call for forking software every time some of these companies make decisions uh, that cause drama, but the other side of it is, all right, cool. Who's gonna pay all the developers? You gotta have a plan for that. You gotta plan for uh, a business model around it. So there is always some level of risk that they could, you know, something could happen to the leadership that runs any of these companies. And suddenly someone goes, you know, uh, these people offered us a lot of money if we <laughs> just stop publishing source code and right, exactly. uh, stop product development, but keep developing the product and, uh, you know, kind of fork it into a closed source model. So, I, but it, I feel as though that's pretty rare. And it's one of the reasons I like a lot of the open source stuff. Matter of fact, F5 Networks has uh, angered the people who, um, if you're not fair, if you're fair with F5, you probably- Absolutely. Yeah, private right. company, and they're also uh, the stewards of Nginx, and mm -hmm. there is now a fork of Nginx out there because um, they apparently I don't know what I don't understand exactly the details, but nonetheless, you see these things happening. You you have um, Terraform. There's some dispute going right. there, and we have Open Tofu, which I just mm -hmm. yeah. I don't know why it's called Open Tofu, but I like the name. <laughs> so <laughs> the um there there are times that the project has enough community behind it, steam behind it, that it will kind of go there. And in Citrix Sensor is an easy example because this was born out of XCPNG is born out of the fork of Citrix being a bad steward of the product. Uh so yeah, I, I don't know that it'll happen. I feel as though they're small enough that Broadcom doesn't care and Broadcom wouldn't be able it'd be too hard and complicated for them to extract the value out of it because, well, you know, they're they're not as embedded as VMware and Broadcom sure. only looks for companies that are embedded that they can squeeze the <laughs> blood from the right. rock. <laughs> exactly. I think one of the other thoughts to that, and I think this is silly to say, but it, it makes sense is that both Vates and uh, Proxmox Server Solutions are European con companies. Very different ethos there. It, exactly. And I think that that, I mean, I mean, it, it is what it is, uh, but I think that that maybe the protections of the EU and the way that that European citizens typically try to view what they do being maybe less pro corporate capitalism stuff. And so I think that that, I think that also makes a pretty big difference, right? Is that, that them as companies, they're not overly concerned about like enriching other stockholders and shareholders and some yeah, big it, company. Things get slimy really quick. Um, as someone who's done in uh, consulting for VCs, which is weird. Um, I don't like them. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> say that. Um, in I, uh, yeah, the it, being adjacent to that world through, you know, I, I'm an investor in another company called Finn. Uh, they do some security stuff, but it was like learning, being on the board there, learning the offers that come in, but what they would have to sacrifice for some really big money. Um, yeah, it's these companies want full control over it. So it's really weird to learn that you, if you need money, sometimes your deals with the devil because the devil is easy to deal with, but you also have to deal with the fact that the devil gets to call the shots, gets um, a large voting share of what get what happens, but they don't sell it that way. It's like they sell it like, oh, we'll be your best partner. We'll send you business. We'll do all this. Then they squeeze you. And right. uh, it's it's interesting to see. So yeah, I, I think there's a lot less of that because of the regulations there. And 
just kind of this less greed that kind of floats around with those people. Um, the We'll call them vulture capitalists. <laughs> there you go. That's a good way to describe it. Um, I have really one more question in, as it pertains to, um, let's call it on-premise uh, virtualization in this case, yeah. right? Um, what are your thoughts on XCPNG and Proxmox uh, kind of, and you're probably going to tell me this, that we, that the XCPNG has already got this on the roadmap, but like they still seem to be lacking very much a homogenous, uh, either Kubernetes K solution or Docker-esque sort of like application container virtualization aspect to them. And I don't know if, um, you know, how you see that mixing for, because if, if you're an if one of these companies that is, is in like a modern internet first sort of company, you're typically already in the cloud. You're already using microservices. You're already doing all these these different sort of modern methodologies for scaling up and doing what you need. But um, I, VMware does technically have Tanzu, right? They were they were on the on the road to getting containerized excuse me containerized workloads working in the hypervisor, and uh, but we still see that missing from the open source ones. Do you think that's a coming thing? Not sure. I, I think they generally take it as a, um, you just run the VMs here and you want to stick Docker on these. No problem. There's plenty of tools to manage Docker. There's plenty of tools mm -hmm. to manage your Kubernetes out there. So you just have to build the virtual machines and run it there. Because somewhere, you know, even when you start slicing this up, is running it in, as XCPNG calls it, DOM zero on the host where you want this. And their answer is really going, no, that's not. There's also the Zen server ethos. Zen server is absolutely one of the best isolation systems out there. It's used heavily in automotive. It has really, really strict partitioning. This is what you lose with Docker is that partitioning level because right. you're sharing the kernel. Um, so I think them staying out of that market makes the most sense to me. And I that seems to be the direction that they're really heading in there. Now, whether or not they, they take Zen Orchestra and allow, and there's actually a way to do this. Uh, there's a way to get some of the Kubernetes information to Zen so it can do some level of control over it. Uh, that was an old, it's actually an old project they had from years ago. It just kind of, the the code's old right now and there's not as much uh, push for it. And of course, they already have LXC containers that you're going to see over in uh, Proxmox. That's all natively right. integrated to them. But yeah, I I don't know. I'm I'm always sketchy just from a computer concept conceptual standpoint. Once you start sharing a kernel, you start sharing potential problems with that. I just want better. We're already dealing with people breaking the uh, isolation of processors and hyper-threading. Uh, exactly, yeah. We're going to have more problems in the future. You can kind of predict it where we see how much we can hammer through Docker and adjacent processes and things like that. I know there's a lot of work against it, but there's in, in someone's going, but Tom, can't you just use Podman? No, you have the same problem. Once you start sharing the kernel, you're really right. close into that bare metal. And Zen servers, uh, heavier isolation. Security is going to be with any of these still paramount going forward. Yeah, I, and I, I, I tend to agree with you on that just because uh, one extra layer of running in a virtual machine also provides you a whole bunch of oversight and utilization control and yeah. prioritization. There's, there's, there's tons of benefit for it, right? And so I, I, I'm not in the camp where I feel like both are actually missing this. I'm with you that I think that not having it in there is probably more of a benefit than having it in there. Um, again, from a security standpoint. Yeah. Well, and they've just done, uh, they did a good write-up on this. There's a whole write-up uh, from one of the latest people they hired on using Packer to automate all of your Linux builds and have them in there. You can have that and they already have Terraform integration. So you can build a lot of auto level of orchestration of, hey, let's automatically build these, deploy these servers here. We can use Packer to make sure our builds are consistent and completely up to date and deploy these VMs. Uh, we actually have a pretty big cloud company we do consulting with on there. Uh, and they built a series of Epic servers and stuff like that. They got thousands of VMs and that's what they use is Terraform uh, to build it all out. And then you have Kubernetes that manage it and they're fine. They, they think that Zen Orchestra mm -hmm. is great. Weirdly, the, the guy who's head of their IT loves it the other people he shares that uh, Zen Orchestra interface with, they they call it the Crayola Cran interface. So <laughs> <laughs> they're less than thrilled. He says, hey, he goes, they don't look at it much because they're Kubernetes people. So <laughs> right, everything is infrastructure for code as code for them anyway. Yeah. So they're just they're just pushing out scripts and having it happen. Um, I I don't know if there's anything you can think of that you'd want to want to add or uh, thoughts in in this whole. I, I think one realm. last comment is. 
I, I encourage people to try them. There's a bunch of other small projects out there. A harvester is probably one of the other ones that comes up a lot, but any of the ones I've seen thus far here in March of 2024 have not been like blow me away for completeness compared to Prox, Box, XC, PNG. But that doesn't mean people shouldn't poke at them. Uh, people ask what I, and I just tell people I don't have time to poke at all of them, uh, but there are a lot of cool projects out there that could be the next one. You know, you never know uh, where they're going. Yeah. So I do encourage people to poke away at a lot of those. Huge numbers of them, of course, are using KVM under the hood. There's not many things using uh, a Zen server under the hood. Uh, it's because Zen's harder to write for because the, those uh, strict isolations that Zen has. But uh, there is one project that uses Zen, which is Cubes. Uh, I encourage people to play with that. If you've never played with Cubes OS, there's a reason it uses uh, Zen for uh, Zen server as its uh, base for how it works. And that's not a hypervisor platform. Cubes is a um, reasonably secure operating system. It's actually one of the most secure OSs you can get. It's really interesting. I just love there's we're a reasonably secure operating system, but anyone who's used it going, it is, it creates containers for our, our Zen uh, isolation for each process that runs. It's really cool when you look at it. That way, no one process can break boundaries into the other. It's got a lot of restrictions. But yeah, I, I encourage everyone to poke at all those things. They're all a lot of fun to play with. But when you, after you play with them, though, you also will get an appreciation for a more complete project like Prox, Vox, Rex, CPNG. <laughs> uh, one thing I wanted to say is, you know, since you were so kind to dedicate your time with me, this evening as we're recording this, uh, you know, what are you working on right now in your channel? I know you're putting out a ton of XCPNG content, which yeah. is phenomenal. And honestly, I've been quietly watching it while I'm doing a bunch of other things. Cause I, I, I mean, I, I, I haven't decided which way I'm going to go. Right. Yeah. I, I officially haven't, but you know, it's pretty clear. I'm leaning one way over the other. And I personally generally or genuinely appreciate the content you're pushing out, but what's, what's else is up for you in the future? Um, you know, the other, the, the, uh, Perfect combination, I think, and because we sold a lot of them, we just know how well they work together, is XCPNG and TrueNAS. So I have a series of videos I'm working on for, I'm just going to do it all with scale. I, I've done enough with Core that and not enough has changed or is going to change in Core. Right. Uh, core is not going away, but it also isn't the one that's getting the most uh, love, so to speak. There's not a lot of new features. It keeps the features it has. So I'm going to do a bunch of deep dives into scale. And I haven't done, it's been probably five or six years since I did a ZFS torture test. And so I'm going to be doing that. I, do, I might do it as a live stream because a lot of people said it was fake when I did my testing. So I might do it as a live stream where I was just ripping drives out of the system. I was even popping memory out of the system while it was running to show how it recovers. Um, and maybe I'll do the same thing for a Zen server, show how bad can we crash the system and show how you can recover for it. But the TrueNAS one's first because everyone worries a lot about their storage, as they should. Um, right. You know, we, we spend a lot of time curating, collecting all the data. We want it to be in a safe space. How safe is it? How resilient is it, I should say, not safe? Uh, so that's going to be one of my next, I, I'm smiling, thinking about how I want to plan this one. I think we even threw water on a motherboard once. We, I got some really old videos if you dig around where we were ZFS torture testing stuff. Uh, it was actually how I got to be uh, friends with some of the people at IX Systems. They thought they were, they're like, our team watched this and thought it was hysterical. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. I, I'm i going to have to look for that. I would love to see. I've never done something as crazy as throw water on. on uh, was it on? Was the server yeah, on? Yeah, yeah. We yeah, I, I think that was one of the tests we did. I remember at least one time we tested, uh, we poured water on one of them just to do it. We had old motherboards, which of course angered people in the comments. They're all, I'm like, oh. they're old motherboards. They're what they were going to get in a recycling bin. They're just good enough to run this, but the data was all there. And <laughs> well, great, Tom. I appreciate your time again and and spending it with me. I think that you and I had talked about maybe doing a, a live show yeah. in a couple of weeks to, to just bring in people's comments. So. If you're watching this and you have comments for Tom or me or for both of us in terms of, of hypervisors and open source, leave your comments there and 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 uh, we should we, I think we should run the the live show on your channel because uh, sure you deserve a little bit out of this too and I appreciate you so much so absolutely all right Tom thank you so much and uh, we'll talk soon sounds good thanks.